Welcome to this uh, technical uh, seminar. This is a part of a seminar that the, the GIZ Fabric, uh, as you can see in the chat, is uh, having. We, are, we will be talking about sustainable alternative fuel sources for the garment factory, particularly in Cambodia, but I would say that I mean, as alternative, uh, pretty much the same thing could be said uh, in uh, in other country, in other country too. Uh, the interest uh, of GIZ Fabric Project for alternative sources of energy to generate steam in the garment factory is actually um, relatively new. We started talking about this uh, topic together with the uh, the, the general energy in the factory, addressing the topic of energy in the factory. Uh, and um, the boiler seems uh, the, the immediate, uh, let's say, uh, low hanging fruit where to start working, uh, working with. Um, in Cambodia, we have a peculiar situation. Just, just to introduce you, um, uh, I... Uh, I mean, I come, my name is Masi, and I come from a background of uh, uh, garment sourcing all over Asia. So um, the situation is different country by country. In Cambodia, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, wood availability, and uh, which is uh, quite cheap. And uh, on the contrary, in Vietnam, there is a lot of coal availability. Uh, rather than in India, we have a a lot of uh, gas, liquid gas, uh, uh, pretty pretty cheap, um, but there is also wood and other and other source of uh, energy. Um, in Bangladesh, is, we have a similar situation. Pakistan again another situation which is a bit different. Therefore, we can discuss all of this, and you can you are most welcome to compare your situation in uh, the other country with the Cambodia one. Today we're going to have a, a presentation by Patrick uh, that uh, works for a, an organization that is called JRS, as you can see from the logo behind his back. Um, he's a specialized, he's a specialized uh, NGO that works on uh, this particular topic of uh, energy. Um, without further ado, I would I would rather leave uh, the uh, the stage. Uh, to Patrick. I hope the discussion will be fruitful for everyone. We will try to address all the questions as I said. So Patrick, um, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Masi. Uh, first of all, thank you to you and to the GIZ for giving us the opportunity to, to share all these findings today in the field of sustainable biomass. Um, before I start, can you confirm that you see the, the screen? Yeah. Okay. That's yes. Great. Uh, my name is Patrick. Thank you, Massy. So I am just the country representative and project manager. I have the privilege to, to share the findings of few studies we have conducted. And I will start right now. But before starting, let me also uh, thank all our funding partners who made this possible, starting first with the European Union. The European Union have a program called Switch Asia. It's a grant program that funds Switch Government Project in Cambodia. So GRS is co-implementing with the Global Green Growth Institute and TAFTAC. TAFTAC is the new name of GMAC. It's actually the Union of Government Manufacturers of the country. And the aim of the project is to increase the competitiveness of the garment sector while decreasing its environmental impact. Uh, it's a four-year program that started in 2024. I would also like to thank Agence Française de Développement, known as AFD, the French Agency for Development, which funded uh, a similar project since 2022, a two-year program with the similar goals. And of course, last but not the least, thank you all GIZ Fabric team, uh, Fabric, works to foster and advance sustainable businesses and responsible practices in the textile industry. They are in Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, China, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. So I hope we have representatives from all these countries. And a small disclaimer to mention that what is going to be introduced today doesn't necessarily reflect the views of our donors. I'll start with a quick sector overview. 
The garment sector in Cambodia represents 43% of industrial factories, and it employs more or less 600,000 workers. It's like 10% of the active population. And 75 of the workers are female. Uh, the statistics are pretty much lower in terms of when it comes to middle management or management. 60% of the employment of the large manufacturing industry is garment industry. And in terms of exports, we are talking about $8 billion in 2021, or 30% of the GDP. CAFTAC, the Union of Manufacturers, regroups more or less 750 members. And the model that applies for the government, uh, for the industry in Cambodia, is the CMT model. So we are really down of the value chain. We don't do fiber production. We don't do yarn production or fabric production, which means we have less issues regarding to chemical waste or water, wastewater management. Uh, but we still have a lot of environmental concern, especially uh, when it comes to steam, as you will see. Uh, in the coming slides. So before digging into the potential for forest wood, uh, plantation wood, I would like to share with you a few information about the importance of steam and what we consider as alternative, sustainable, uh, sustainable alternative for steam production. To understand what is the importance of steam, uh, we have this small drawing that explains that fuels are actually input into boilers, and then the steam that is produced goes for the ironing, washing, dyeing, dyeing, fabric relaxation, but also for cutting or pressing. So there's a lot of processes that require steam in the garment sector. This steam can be um, recovered through condensate recovery system or steam traps, and it goes back into the system again, and so on and so on. Next slide. So previous studies helped us to identify six alternative solutions, and we will focus today on number six, traceable wood. But I think it's important that you get an idea uh, very shortly of what are the older, other alternatives. And we will start with the first one, the briquettes and pellets. They are widely used in Southeast Asia, in particular in Vietnam and in Thailand, but not in Cambodia. Why? because of the price and because the market is not very well structured. So on the left and in the middle, you can see the briquettes. And on the right side, you can see the pellets. The briquettes have one good advantage, is that they can use in the existing equipment in Cambodia. I am referring to fixed grade boilers. They are low efficient boilers maximum 65%, but our studies show that in Cambodia, 40% of the boiler have less than 40% efficiency. And this is mostly because they are fixed grade boiler, um, not well maintained or a bit old equipment. As for the, the pellets, they are really interesting, but if you want to use them, you will need to upgrade your boilers with a, a moving grade or even change your boiler and buy a freedized bed boiler or compact biomass boiler, which are often more expensive than the fixed grade boilers. Another type, another sustainable alternative comes from agro residues, uh, byproducts from agriculture systems. For instance, but not uh, exhaustively, you can find cassava, rice straw, corn cobs, sugar cane, and cashew husks. All of them have pros and cons. If you talk about cassava and corn cobs, the issue is that in Cambodia, they are often exported to foreign countries as a whole, so you cannot use the byproducts. The rice straw might be, for instance, interesting, but the density is so low that the transportation cost would be too high. As for sugarcane and cashew husk, uh, they are uh, byproducts that we want to explore further. Still, if you want to use this uh, type of biomass, you will need another type of boiler. So again, another investment, but this type of boiler have a very high efficiency compared to the previous one. And the advantage is that you can um, replace one product by another one and then face the market volatility or shortage in production. 
The next alternative I want to talk about is rice husk. For those who don't know, rice is actually the biggest commodity in Cambodia. You can find it everywhere. And it has also the advantage of having more energy content than wood, 20 to 40 percent. However, the density is very low. So again, for this type of biomass, it's the same as previously. You will face a difficulty in terms of transportation. There is a price volatility. And there is also competition with the brick sector, the cement sector, and other industrial sector that have a high demand for such biomass. In terms of carbon emissions, it's very good because uh, it's carbon zero, not zero. And I will go now to the next uh, alternative. Let's talk very quickly about electric boilers or decentralized electrical steam generation. The efficiency here is the highest, above 95%, because it produces steam only when you need it. And it's suitable for units who use uh, small amounts of steam, like ironing only or occasional washing and drying. However, in Cambodia, this is not the best solution so far because until recently, the share of solar electricity that you can um, install in your factory and combine with such boiler was limited to 50%. And then there was a capacity charge also that really made factories reluctant to make such investments. Also, the cost of electricity in Cambodia is among the highest in Southeast Asia. We are talking about 13 cents more or less per kilowatt hour, uh, which really discouraged some factories to, to use such system. And also, going electric doesn't necessarily mean uh, going green. If you look at the energy mix in Cambodia, you can find on the left, uh, 2021, the left uh, of the chart, that we are balanced almost 50-50 if you compare the share of renewable energy and the share of fossil fuels. However, according to the expert projections, the share of fossil fuels is going to increase. So if you cannot connect your boiler with only solar energy, you will have to connect it with the grid and then you will produce more and more uh, carbon. Let's now talk quickly about solution number five, solar industrial heating process. On the upper right corner of the screen, you will see uh, how it works. It's very basic. The sun heat uh, a collector, and then there is a heat exchanger that allows the use of hot water or steam uh, at low temperature. And this is good for Cambodia because we have eight hours of sun per day in average, which means a very high uh, average solar in radiation. But as I told you, in Cambodia, in Cambodia, it's mostly CMT. So um, we don't do the dyeing process. We don't do the bleaching process. However, this is very interesting for the food industry or in other countries when, where they have textile mills. They can use such technology for cleaning the cotton looms, produce viscose or polyester, every processes that are uh, below 200 degrees Celsius, I would say. And finally, that's why you are here. The um, traceable, identifiable wood residues from plantations. We know that in Cambodia, uh, large plantations can provide residues because the trees have reached the end of their life cycle. We are talking here about acacia or eucalyptus or cashew wood, even rubber wood, and even fruits, uh, orchard fruits like mangoes. Uh, the problem was we needed to do more investigation to assess the feasibility to use plantation wood at scale. And this is uh, the reason why we conducted the study. So the next slides summarize all that I reviewed with you. You have in line the six alternatives and in columns the different criteria. And we wanted to dig into traceable wood because we find it a good compromise and also because from a factory perspective, it makes sense actually. If you look at the comparison of the cost per ton of steam produced, wood is actually the cheapest uh, source, the cheapest fuel. There is one that is cheaper, actually we, I refer to the fabric waste, um, but we don't 
want to promote this technology so far in Cambodia. Uh, first of all, there are few suppliers, but also the capacity of operators are limited, um, and it can lead to the emission of harmful toxic, toxic substances. If you want to know more, there's a link to a webinar on boiler operation that will appear in the chat. Uh, if you want to know more about the, the pros and cons of different types of boiler, it's very, very insightful. Um, so, since factories are also interested in the value for money, uh, wood seems a very good, promising uh, source of energy. That's why now we are going to explore how we can provide alternatives to forest wood and use plantation wood, what is the potential, what is also the current demand for wood in the sector. And to answer all these questions, we have hired, together with the GIZ, the European Union, and the IFD fundings, uh, we have recruited a team composed of Yann Francois, which is a former expert, a biomass expert for GRS during many years, who is now leading Forest AI. Uh, you can check the website, Forest AI. He recently developed an app that can help you to identify uh, by capturing a a shot of a wood sample, you can identify if it's a forest wood or plantation wood, and even what species are we talking about. Just go on the website, you will find more information. This, the research team was also composed of Mr. Sopana Noon, um, he's a national expert. He also contributed to the development of the national energy efficiency policy. He also ran Green Move Consulting that provides services around energy for private sector and industry. And also for the data collection in the fields, uh, it had been possible, made possible, thanks to Mr. Vondarit and Shomni Chet from KGC, or Kmal Green Charcoal, which is a private business, but also a social business, aiming at uh, producing sustainable charcoal, green charcoal in Cambodia. The study lasted from the third quarter, no, the last quarter of 2022 and the first quarter of this year, during which uh, there was a combination of literature review, interviews, data collection in the fields, and you can see on the pictures the teams in action. So first we will start with the assessment of the wood fuel demand and the wood fuel availability in the industry and in the garment sector. In this slide, you can see the different, uh, the number of boilers by type that are registered at the Ministry of Industry. You can see that on the left, uh, you will find 2016, on the right, 2021. Over time, the number of boilers dramatically increased, but this increase is mostly a uh, decrease in decentralized electric boiler. As of today, the two more main categories of boiler used in the industry are firewood and biomass boiler and electric boilers. But keep in mind that the energy delivered by an electric boiler is much lower than the energy that you will uh, produce with a centralized system, uh, meaning a firewood boiler. So that was for the whole industry. But if we look at the garment sector, we have identified the share of boiler fuel type, and there is a strong correlation between the previous slide and this one, because we know that 50% of the boilers are actually wood boilers, followed by 25% electric boilers. And if you compare the share of electricity and wood in a factory that is using wood for steam generation, you will see on the left, uh, the diagram in the middle, that wood represents only a very small share of the energy costs, uh, the energy costs being dominated by electricity actually. And this can highlight the very low cost of uh, wood compared to its energy content. Because when you look at the energy delivered, uh, most of the energy is coming from the wood in terms of terajoule, while only 10% is coming from electricity. Now, if you want to understand which type of factory is actually requesting wood for steam generation, this slide will help you. On the left slide, uh, on the left part, we isolated sweater and denim factories, while on the right side, we isolated sportswear factory. 
In the middle, we put all the other factories, and it is clear now that uh, we can find that the sweater and denim factories are the big steam users, especially for the washing and dyeing process that still relies on the wood boilers. This type of factory, sweater and denim, actually represents a quarter, 25% of the garment factories in Cambodia. So if you want to develop programs targeting sustainable biomass, this will be your primary target. Now, if you want to know how much wood is used in the sector for a year, check the next slide. We estimate the total wood consumption at 700,000 cubic meters a year. This is the total wood consumption to satisfy the demand in the sector with a large share of forest wood that is estimated at 400,000 cubic meter. To give you a non-scientific uh, comparison, we can say it represents, the total demand represents the area of 10,000 soccer fields. And within this 10,000, 6,000 would be forest wood fields. Um, also, what is important to notice is that previous study highlighted a lower demand. The demand was 300,000 cubic meter. However, we calculate it differently. We cannot compare it. We can just say that uh, we think there is a strong increase in the demand over the years between uh, the study that was published in 2019 and today. To better understand the wood consumption, you need also to better understand the difference of quality between the woods. And in this slide, for instance, we have measured the content moisture, the moisture content of different woods. And we compare on the first line, cashew, or we can almost say plantation wood and forest wood. There are significant difference between those two, especially the plantation wood is generally more uh, moist. And it means it reduces its economic performance compared to forest wood. Also, the, the homogeneity of forest wood is, is stronger. You have a lot of viability in plantation wood. If you look at the, the right side, we compare the price per unit of energy of the different source of firewood. And you can see on the first line that forest wood seems more expensive. It's $25 per cubic meter. Um, in Cambodia factory, they usually pay their wood per volume, not per weight. So you might wonder why factories still pay for wood that is more expensive. Actually, this is rational because despite being more expensive, the wood from the forest is more dense, is drier, and it has a higher calorific value. At the end of the day, it's cheaper to produce energy with forest wood than cashew, rubber, or acacia, unfortunately. So on this graph, you can see that we try to compare um, horizontally the, the moisture content of the wood and vertically the cost of um, the cost per gigajoule of useful energy. So orange will be forest wood, and in blue we took the cashew wood. I'll try to get the laser. Uh, give me a minute. No, pointer tool. Okay, good. Um, if you use um, plantation wood with a 40% moisture content, the cost per gigajoule of energy will be much higher than forest wood. But if you manage to reduce the humidity of your cashew wood, there is no much difference between the cost of cashew wood and the cost of uh, forest wood per unit of energy. So what I want to say is that drying significantly reduces the fuel costs. And what you need to know is factory usually use low efficient boilers and manual firewood loading. So they will tend to like moist wood because it reduces the frequency of refills in the boiler and the, burn, uh, the wood burns slower. That was for the current demand of wood in the sector. And let's now discuss about the framework for sustainable biomass. As you may know, the International Energy Agency sees biomass energy as essential 
to achieve a net zero transition by 2050. So the industry needs to define a framework for sustainable wood energy. In other words, what would we consider sustainable for biomass consumption? And the research team came up with this model, which is divided in five parts. Uh, first is the sourcing, then you have the processing, followed by the transportation, the end users, and the legal framework. So the framework mentions that you should actually use only plantation wood or agricultural uh, residues or wood processing residues, and no residues from natural ecosystems. Also, it's important to be careful of the amount that you will use to make sure you can allow uh, regeneration of organic matter. As for the processing, we should prioritize residues from wood processing and uh, agricultural projects. Also, we should try to combine um, biomass densification with renewable energy and the GSG emissions resulting from the processing should be reported. For instance, if you use uh, a, a press or an extruder to produce a briquette with rice husk, you need to count the energy electricity consumption in your GHG emission. And the same, it goes the same way for uh, transportation. Transportation should be taking, taken in account is in the GHG inventories. That's why you will try to um, prioritize uh, source as close as possible from your factory. And in terms of end users, we should prioritize biomass for uh, process requiring high temperature and when steam is used at large scale, for instance. So this should also include the investments in energy efficiency and regular monitoring to make sure operation and maintenance is optimized. For the legal framework, what is missing today, but what is needed is a traceability system to track down the fuel used from the source to the equipment. Also, we need to make sure that we comply with the laws um, in, and laws, the existing laws and monitor that our activity is not going against these laws. So the next slide is about um, the assessment and mapping of sustainable biomass according to the research team in Cambodia. We can see on the screen cashew and rubber plantations in Cambodia, so you can see the different province borders, and most of these plantations are available in the, let's say, in the center of the country. Provinces of Kampong Tom, Kache, uh, Kampong Cham are the areas where we will find the large plantations. If you look at the projection, we will start with rubber wood. We can see that now we are in uh, 2023, but starting 2020, 2030, we can see that there will be already 1 million cubic meter available each year and more to come until uh, 2040. So it's very promising. And if you look at the data collected by the team on cashew plantations, we have the same trends. Again, 1 million cubic meter available in 2030 and more to come. Still, we need to consider there are some uh, competitive use. But before that, I'd like to mention there's also a potential for rice husk estimated at 500,000 to 700,000 ton a year, which alone would satisfy the entire demand of the sector if the sector was properly equipped. In terms of competition, now we have uh, identified a clear competition for rubber with the brick factories and a demand exceeding a million cubic meter a year. And in the long run, in the long term, the export market will be the main competitor, especially uh, firewood traders and ESCO, energy service companies, for instance, from Vietnam, sourcing their wood in Cambodia. We already have found a such case happening on rubber in two provinces and on Acacia in another one. Also, the cost of wood sheep in Vietnam is way more 
uh, expensive than in Cambodia. So it, it leads Vietnamese uh, factories to source them to source in Cambodia. To conclude on that, we can say that plantation residues appear sufficient to supply the whole sector need in the short and medium term, that uh, rubber wood plantation and other plantation wood is also expected to strongly increase, increase and will satisfy the demand. Uh, also, the price in, uh, will likely increase, but they could be offset by switching to more efficient uh, boiler, accept, accepting a wider range of biomass. On the next slide, we try to compare uh, different fuel available, biomass fuel available for steam generation. And you, are, you will find them in, in line, in colon. These are the criteria against which we compare them. So as you can notice with the color code, forest wood is the highest quality fuel, but the most unsustainable. Practically, it's untraceable, and wood laundering is still happening, unfortunately. As for the wood plantation, they tend to have lower quality, especially for cashew, but they remain mostly suitable in current technologies, the fixed grade boiler that we can find. Uh, they can also con be considered sustainable if we ensure that the plantation actually do not replace natural ecosystems and the trustability will be easier when sourcing directly from large plantations. There is still a possibility for smallholders to, to sell their supply uh, through middlemen. Also, if you look at the rice husk, it can be considered of the highest sustainability, given that it's a processing residue and not a harvesting residue. Also, um, the problem is the equipment that factories are using today is not uh, adapted to this technology. It also generates a lot of ashes and requires manual workforce. So now if we look at the suitability, you have to understand it as suitability in a factory perspective. The way we put the color is just suitability for a factory. Uh, we then analyze this in more details. For each type of biomass, we compare the suitability if you use a fixed grade boiler as it is now, or if you use chain grade boilers or freelance bed boilers. Um, we can see that with the current situation, uh, we understand why the factories are still using forest wood and we need to promote a switch to modern boilers if you want to promote also the use of other type of biomass. That's why based on all these findings, the research team established a roadmap for the garment sector, both for the supply side and the wood demand side. Let's say in biomass, sorry, I put wood, we can say biomass. Um, it, is, it will be needed on the supply side to develop minimum sustainability requirements. And who can do that? It's actually the brand and the government. They need to develop minimum startups or requirements and to turn this into an actual action plan. It will be also needed on the supply side to promote partnerships with biomass suppliers and long-term partnerships so that they would allow in equipment for biomass processing and uh, for instance, to produce pellets or to produce uh, briquettes or whatever needs to, to be purchased for the processing. And it would allow them also to pre-dry the wood on site. There's something we have found when working with the factories is space is very limited and you need to pre-dry the wood on site to address this issue. Also on the supply side, it will be needed to support factories with a roadmap on multi-fuel strategy to allow them to reduce the fuel demand and also to phase out from forest wood. That was a requirement from the supply side. And on the demand side, what needs to be done is first to improve at the factory level or at the industry level, the efficiency of the steam systems. For instance, by recovering the, the heat, or my, minimizing the loss, insulating the pipes, and also through a better operation and maintenance, we have conducted a lot of uh, 
surveys on the current capacity, and we know that they are limited and needs to be to be uh, built in terms of operation and maintenance. One also um, solution is to switch to electricity, especially if you manage to switch fully to solar, then you will you will be carbon neutral. And it's only applicable, unfortunately, to factories with small uh, steam needs. That's why it will be also needed to help factories switching to other type of boilers, allowing multiple types of biomass to address the, the shortage, the price volatility, and uh, uh, yeah, that's all. So this is the last slide. There are some takeaway notes I've prepared for you. The first one being that Forest wood remains, unfortunately, the preferred fuel for factories, but concerns arise around its origin and environmental impacts. And we know also that biomass residues from plantation, as well as rice husk, offer sustainable alternative to forest wood. And we expect this supply to increase over time. Over time. Switching to sustainable chain genera generation requires investment in new technologies and also improvement of practices in terms of energy efficiency. Also, a comprehensive roadmap addressing uh, supply and demand side intervention is needed for long-term sustainability. And today, we know that the lack of sustainability requirements, either from the government side or the brand side, along with inadequate tools for reporting, poses a barrier to achieving sustainable biomass energy in the sector. So external action is needed from the brands and from the government to drive meaningful change in the industry. And now this is my last slide. Yes, I hope it was interesting for you. Thanks for your attention. And I think we will have a round of questions and answers. Maybe some of the research team also join me for this uh, session. Yes, absolutely. Um, I saw there are a couple of questions in the in the chat already. Okay. And uh, some of the research team are also here, but I, I want to add uh, a, a couple of information uh, more for uh, our public. Um, so the energy cost in a garment factory in Cambodia, where there is only the transformation from textile to a T-shirt, only the last stitching stage, let's say, um, the energy cost is 80, made up to 85% of electricity cost. But the steam represents, again, 80% of the energy required by the factory. So. But it, that 80% costs only 5%. So uh, the problem is the, the availability of wood that is very cheap, and therefore the boiler is often neglected, and uh, the operators are not the most qualified one. Uh, that leads to the inefficiency that Patrick was saying. Um, perhaps the first two days when they are trained, they are attentive and they let the boiler run at the best of the efficiency, but after some time, somehow the attention goes down and, uh, and uh, the boiler is either overfed or too low fed, or it started with fabric because it starts faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, second consideration is that um, there is a, a more and more attention from at least European Union side about uh, deforestation and all the possible deforestation that has come as uh, an outcome of uh, uh, an order placed from a brand. Uh, and that uh, comes particularly into the law called uh, due diligence and the environmental part that is related to the due diligence. Essentially, every brand has to minimize the risk of that deforestation happening because of your order placed somewhere around the world. Uh, therefore, 
our interest uh, of the GAZ. So having said that, there are there is a couple of questions. There are a couple of questions from Joseph Strasser, uh, quite interesting, and maybe uh, you or the team of KGC can address that. Yeah, um, I can one goes just, like this. Uh, Joseph, you want to? I don't know if Joseph can unmute himself and ask the question directly. Can we unmute him? Let me see if I can do that. Yes. Joseph, can you speak? I think I can. No, I cannot do that. I will read the question for him. Uh, plantation wood means tree planted in monoculture, question mark. How sustainable is that? For instance, in terms of forest recovery and net carbon emissions. Carlo, uh, you might want to address that well, or somebody else? Uh, I don't know if they can unmute themselves. Uh, yeah, they Annie, can you, uh, Annie, can you unmute Mr. Carlo? Or Mr. Francesco? I'm not able to do that. Okay. Yeah, Carlo, you are co-host, you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Mm, yes. Yes. So um, it's a, it's a very good question, and uh, but the answer is also quite simple: is that we are not using uh, we're not doing energy plantations, so we are not planting trees to produce firewood, but it's uh, uh, we are only going to use uh, wood residues from agricultural plantations. So it's uh, um, Patrick mentioned. Uh, uh, acacia and uh, rubber, which are agricultural, uh, or um, timber plantations or acacia plantations that produce veneer for uh, hardwood flooring and uh, plywood. So basically, these type of regulations, I saw also the second question uh, about these uh, intensive plantations, these type of uh, regulations should uh, is addressing the agricultural sector and not so much the uh, energy sector. What we are doing in this case is just re uh, using wood residues from this plantation. So in terms of uh, uh, rubber, for example, every 20, 25 years, uh, the plantation gets cut and replanted. Uh, the same, something similar happens also for cashew and uh, for acacia, these uh, cycles are much uh, shorter. Uh, for example, seven years where for the veneer production and the uh, the firewood is only uh, the residues, which is about 50% uh, or 40% of the tree that which at the moment gets discarded. So to answer the question is uh, these type of regulations and concerns uh, should be addressed in the agricultural sector because we are only using residues from the agricultural sector. I hope this answered the question. There is a continuation to that, actually. Um, and it goes like, in addition to my previous question, there are environmental application, implications of extensive forest plantation for agriculture. I was wondering what impact it has on soil, soil degradation, loss of soil fertility and productivity, etc. How is the cooperation between the different ministries on sustainably exploiting wood for biomass? Yeah, Carlo. We can't hear you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, this is what I was saying. Um, it's basically the, we are not using wood for biomass energy. These plantations are for agricultural produce. So it's for rubber production or for cashew production. So all these concerns are relevant uh, when uh, 
you need also to protect the soil fertility and uh, intensive plantation. Every agricultural plantation uh, can be a damage for the soil, but uh, it's not uh, at this point. I think it's uh, we, we are overarching too much, and it goes into agricultural policies rather because as as I mentioned already, we are not using we are not uh, talking about energy plantations meaning trees planted only for biomass energy use, but it's uh, for rubber, for cashew, for hardwood flooring, and only the residues of these supply chains would end up into the boilers of the garment sector. Thank you, Carlo, for the explanation. Mr. Joffe, Joseph, you can speak now if you want to continue the conversation. Otherwise, if somebody else has some other question? Uh, maybe we can introduce Carlo because I didn't introduce Carlo uh, <laughs> before giving him the floor. Carlo is, is a founder of KGC, Kmal Green Charcoal, for those who wonder. Um, it's uh, obvious that a plantation, to make a plantation, uh, probably uh, forest has been clear. Um, we actually, uh, and it's not the ideal solution in that sense. Uh, we are, we, we know about that, but uh, as Carlo already replied, um, it's, it's about the substituting the plantation trees after a, a number of years and therefore the availability of them of existing plantation already in Cambodia uh, can be high enough to support the entire garment industry. The ideal, in an ideal world, we would like to rather channelize as much as possible, uh, we call it sustainable wood, although it's not a perfect fitting word for it. Um, but we would like to channelize, let's say, non-forest wood uh, into the garment sector, not because we are accusing the garment sector of deforestating uh, Cambodia. That would, be, that would be not true because uh, the real consumption lies in the private uh, household, uh, not in the industrial uh, use of it, of the charcoal, but, uh, but in order to help the entire, the entire uh, sector to be, to be greener. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, everybody is scrambling to get alternative from uh, uh, coal, from fossil fuel coal. Um, and there are a few people from Vietnam in the public. I would uh, rather be very curious to know uh, their opinion on, uh, on the topic. I saw a couple of people with a Vietnamese name and surname. So if you want to write something into the, into the chat, would be, it would be uh, great. Book, for example, from Luan Garment. So, if there are no more questions, I would rather talk about, uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the new HIG regulation, uh, about the new HIG regulation that are uh, going to be rolled out in November 23, right? Carlo, can you tell us more about it? Can the administrator, Unmute Carlo, please. We cannot hear you. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, uh, yeah, I can say something about the HIC also to close on the previous question. Uh, it's the same problem with rice husk. If uh, a rice field has been 
planted uh, where forest has been uh, cut down is the same as uh, if it was a rubber plantation or uh, a cashew nut plantation or a rice field. So uh, that's why I was talking. It's more like an agricultural policy uh, um, uh, matter. Uh, regarding the HIG, uh, it's very relevant uh, to this presentation that Patrick gave because uh, um, from November 2023, uh, while biomass was always uh, considered renewable energy, now biomass is uh, considered renewable energy only if certified with international uh, certification standards. So there are a famous one like FSC or other ones that uh, certify that the biomass uh, comes from uh, plantations or and that the plantation didn't displace a natural forest in the last 10 years at least. Uh, but the, it, it also keeps a window open to national uh, certification schemes or other proposals uh, that can be evaluated by the HIG, uh, which still need to include a proof of sustainability of the wood through a mechanism of chain of custody, which means you need to know where the wood comes from and you need to be prove that the wood is definitely comes from those sustainable sources. So yeah, biomass, uh, as Patrick was saying, it will be in the picture for uh, carbon neutrality, the global carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, it has its challenge and it's uh, coming more and more into the picture also and from the regulation point of view. I see Joseph uh, raise his hand. Sorry, I couldn't speak before. Can you hear me? Yeah. I would have another question, but it's not directly related to HIG, if that is okay, as we have only yeah. five minutes. I was just wondering regarding the boilers. I mean, how efficient are the boilers in terms of producing consistent steam? right now and how important or how effective are the different materials when it comes to producing uh, consistent steam which is necessary for some processes in in garment production for ironing for instance so i was wondering are there differences or or does it not matter at all yeah sorry mm -hmm. it's a completely uh off topic yeah. no not off topic but at least not related to it sorry Definitely. Uh, actually, switching, uh, I will start to that, uh, Carlo, if it's okay. Um, switching to sustainable, su sustainable biomass doesn't come alone, and it goes with an improvement in the technologies that you use to, to, to burn this biomass. And this question is highly relevant. Um, if, you, if you consider the, the boilers that are used currently, we consider that maybe uh, the eff efficiency is uh, approximately 50%. And you can have more losses if you consider uh, uninsulated pipes, if you consider the leaks, the leakage. Um, if, so it starts from 40%. The fixed weight boilers that we commonly find have up to 65% maximum efficiency. There are very few biomass, compact biomass boiler or freelance bed boiler. Those have 80% efficiency. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, if the factory can switch to this type of boiler, it will compensate also the increase in the price of sustainable biomass. Um, if you use the electric boilers, maybe it's 98% efficiency. I don't know if it understands your, if it answers your question. Yes, it uh, it actually does answer my question. I was just wondering also if it has an effect on the final product. I mean, if you, with 60, 80, or 98% of efficiency, if you also see the difference in the quality of the final product, I mean, as you need, as I said before, consistent steam for pressing ironing, for instance, so is that already, um, have you already practiced it? And how do people in the factories respond to this, to the use of, more efficient, I mean, energy efficient boilers, but does it also have an impact, a positive impact on the quality of the final product? I can't answer this one, but if anyone knows the answer, please raise your hand. Uh, I, I, will, I would reply to that. Um, 
no, Joseph. Uh, I would say it doesn't affect what I'm saying. In the me, what I mean for that is this: if you have ten production line running, and your boiler is not efficient enough. Uh, Let's say your boiler is always running at 40%, 50% efficiency. Uh, most probably that 50% has been always enough to run those 10 lines steam. Okay. Uh, so the efficiency would rather help in the amount of fuel. If you increase the efficiency or you put a fluidized bed, uh, that I mean, you still need uh, X amount of uh, steam uh, to feed those 10 uh, production lines, but you can use less fuel. So the efficiency is rather, uh, uh, most probably the factory is using an inefficient method to run the same amount of lines. I don't know if I was clear enough. Yes. But, I mean, um, you know, if there is no pressure with the, of steam, you cannot actually iron. Yeah. And, and you will have nine of those production lines, not ten. Uh, and therefore, and therefore they, uh, I mean, uh, either, either you can use the production line or you cannot use. It's not that you use it half and half with the steam, without steam, or with very low pressure. Immediately, the, the finishing will send back, will start sending back the, the, the pieces uh, with non-ironed. There's no, there's no question on that. Um, very few bad factory would, would pack pieces non-iron. Well, I mean, thank you very much, Masi and Carlo and yeah, I think Patrick. Well, it's uh, it's three o'clock. It's actually exactly uh, one hour that we started. If uh, th there is one uh, um, participant, uh, Jean Charles uh, de Montaigne, that I believe is a manager of uh, a rice uh, mill uh, where they produce a lot of this uh, husk. He had a few questions and uh, he had contacted us a few days ago. If you want to say something. JC? Yeah. Can you? You hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, uh, exchange because it's very, very interesting. It is quite new for us. So uh, we are a rice miller, we are based in Batamon. Uh, and actually, I was quite interested to. Uh, have more information regarding how we could participate into the uh, sustainability of the of the garment industry through as well our rice industry, which is as well uh, quite uh, high in uh, using energy. So we burn as well, uh, as you may know, we burn our husk to uh, uh, use our dryer because we dry the wet putty that we in, that we take from the from the fields. And we have a lot of husk that is not properly uh, actually uh, uh, transformed to, 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 to benefit for uh, the industry or other industry. It's basically uh, we send it out to workers who will often export it to Thailand under the radar for uh, fertilizing or as well for biomass to the Thai factories. Okay, as you know, Batamon is very close to the Thai border. So a lot of this husk goes to Thailand to uh, more, let's say, uh, participate into the, the Thai uh, uh, production. So we are looking for ways to uh, try to stop it on our level and see how we could maybe be part of that uh, project by providing this husk, rice husk to the factories uh, and to maybe understand more what conditions, how we would, uh, how the, the, the factories would need the husk. Uh, we are looking for as well ways to maybe transform this husk into some small bricks, for example, to, to, to 
facilitate the, and to, to have a better, uh, uh, let's say, burning ratio for, for, for the factories. This is what we're trying to understand here. So do you see any any future, any good prospect for as well the rice miller to be part of this uh, this uh, project or that the, the, the garment factories could benefit from it? Patrick. Okay. Um, thank you, for Charles. I think we definitely need to, to meet if you are based in Cambodia. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, to make it short, definitely we see a high potential for, for rice husk. Um, but um, it depends on the, which form. Uh, today we can only use it in the form of briquettes because the factories are not equi equipped uh, adequately. Uh, still, there's a potential for that, and over time we know that they will modernize their equipments if the brands or government, and I think it will be the case because of the national energy efficiency policy that uh, aims at defining minimum standard, minimum performance standard. Um, the boiler that they use today will not be uh, allowed in the future. So rice has a very high energy um, calorific value. And also, as I mentioned earlier, it's the first commodity in the country. So we think there is potential and maybe we can try to work together, Jerez and you, in piloting a small, a small scale project uh, with factories using rice husks to demonstrate the added value and to address the challenges. There was some research conducted in the past that shows today uh, it's, it's still a problem even if you use it as briquettes because it needs more workforce. It, it generates a lot of ashes. Uh, it also needs a lot of storage areas, and it quite it can be discouraging also when you know that uh, they run out, they can run out of rice uh, two or three months during the year while they need heat all the, all the time. But yes, there is there is potential for for research, and we can we can try to do something together. If someone wants to add. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, nothing wrong with uh, rice husk and uh, to be used uh, not even in the garment factory, but uh, for God's sake, in any other uh, in any other process that can be uh, useful and successfully, uh, how to say, turn into energy in any other project. Uh, project. Uh, as I said again, the boiler is uh, um, neglected most of the time. Uh, and uh, and that needs uh, always uh, more uh, attention. Uh, that's it. With this, I would uh, rather close the the technical seminar. I hope it was uh, um, interesting for everyone and the participants. Uh, thank you for uh, putting across your questions. Uh, I don't see any more any more inquiry in the chat. Therefore, we can um, uh, we can close it, I guess. Thank you. We appreciate. Uh, there is a form that has been posted in the chat. I please request you uh, a feedback form. I please request you to go uh, on the on the link and uh, leave your feedback. <laughs>